Welcome to the Sankofa Pan Africa series. My name is Bumio Nyisa. In this episode, we'll be continuing from where we left off. We'll be continuing in the celebration of the spirit of Africville with Juanita Peters, the director of the Africville Museum. When was Africville finally destroyed? When late 19 it? yeah late 1960s uh the last uh person to leave uh was Paul Carvery in 1970 uh but the majority of the community was demolished uh by 1967 68 and um just to add insult to injury here we are 2020 and people are still asking the question so if you come to africville uh you will see uh the wide open land where you know originally the the um narrative as to why africville had to be destroyed was for industrial reasons it was part of the industrial revolution uh and um uh but if you come to africville you'll see that that did not happen and so People say our lives were disrupted, our lives were changed forever, and for what? There's a park there. Tell us some more about the effects of um, the destruction yeah. of um, Africa. I want people to imagine, you know, that their whole lives have been uprooted. Um, and uh, not just your life, but your your future has been changed. Your children and your grandchildren's future has been changed. And as I said, the narrative at the time uh, was that this was part of an urban planning, urban renewal, and um, that there was going to be a number of things there. It was People were moved out because of the construction of the new bridge. Uh, but if you visit Africville today, um, here it is 2020, over 50 years later, it, uh, it's just a park. And even worse than that, it was a dog park. So people would bring their dogs there to run freely <laughs> and, uh, and poop on the land. And so if you, you know, want to talk about adding insult to injury, that is it, you know, at its highest level. Um, and also the, I need to talk about what that does to people emotionally uh, spiritually, uh, it's it's traumatic. It's traumatic to think that your life is so much less valued than a dog. I know. I visited Africville a few times when I lived in Nova Scotia, and it was always so heartbreaking. Especially, um, I remember going there. I think um, on a Sunday after church, and the whole park was filled with um, people who had brought their dogs, you know, to walk and they were pooing all over the place. And it was just very, very depressing because yeah. by then I had heard about the kind of, um, um, the, the rich cultural life that existed in the place known as Africville before it was raised to the ground. I mean, there were his churches, you know, it was a whole vibrant community, you know, that was, um, destroyed and then they turned into a place where people could just uh, bring their dogs to it's 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 sad so not nothing much has happened and I, I, well it, about 10 years ago nine or 10 years ago the government did uh redesignate it as not an off-leash dog park uh people can still bring their dogs though but they have to be on leash and um as executive director of the museum I'm often having to go out and explain to people that their dogs can't run free on the land. You'd be very surprised as to the uh, reaction that I get from some people. Uh, most people understand and we redirect them as to where they can go. And other people actually take offense that they cannot let their dogs run free on this land. If they look at it as, as their, their right. And so um, it's very interesting last year uh, because the museum portion of the land, which is 2.5 acres, uh, is private property. It is owned by the Africville Heritage Trust, which I manage. And so last year, just an ex as an experiment, I put signs up on our property saying no dogs allowed. And um, it seems to have spread <laughs> to people thinking that, that that also means the park. And I'm good with that. <laughs> 
I, I also know there used to be gatherings, you know, to commemorate the destruction of Africville. Can you tell us a bit more about how that started and, you know, what kind of um, effects it's had in at least bringing people, uh, bringing to people's attention how important a part of um, African Nova Scotian history Africville is? So uh, some time ago, three women uh, decided it was really important to find a way to make sure that people always connected. Uh, Brenda Steed Ross, Linda Mantley, and Deborah Dixon. And these three women started something called the Africville Genealogy Society. And in that society, they collected information about Africville. There was a website created. And most importantly, they started something called the Africville Reunion. And that reunion gathers and invites people uh, who are descendants from Africville to come back and uh, be on the land. They pitch their tents for four days or up to 10 days every five years. Um, and they pitch those tents, those uh, trailers, those motorhomes uh, on the spots where their family home would have been. It's really um, very a, a very emotional weekend because sometimes what people do is they just want to be there. They just want to be amongst each other and sharing stories and music. They have a number of events as well. The biggest um, event of the reunion uh, and the most powerful one for me is the finale, the church service. And uh, that church service no, not only has the people who come for the reunion, but it draws in people from various communities. So you can have anything from a couple hundred people, uh, a few hundred people to a, uh, to a thousand people easily at that church service. And it's outside, under a big tent, on the land, um, you know, praising, you know, so what more could you ask? It's wonderful. Not too long ago, the community got an apology. Yes. I mean, was it just an apology with words or did anything more tangible than words come from the apology? Sure. In 2010, the uh, city of Halifax under then Mayor Kelly uh, gave a formal apology to the former residents and descendants of Africville. And in that apology came 2.5 acres of original Africville land uh, to uh, the trust and also monies to build what is now known as the Africville Museum. It is a replica of Seaview Baptist Church, one of the original churches in Africville. And inside it houses artifacts and stories uh, of the of Africville, and those stories come through everything from um, interpretive panels to actual touch kiosks, where you can uh, touch the kiosk and listen to stories and see uh, former residents telling particular stories about life in Africville. Um, so, in the last uh, uh, few years, uh, we've had uh, a number of different partnerships uh, with the city in helping us uh, find other ways to, to tell those stories. We have six new uh, interpretation pieces that are going in on the land, so outside the church, that'll be there by this, uh, probably this, this late summer. Uh, and those pieces will tell uh, stories that uh, are not inside the, the museum. And one of my favorite pieces that I'm looking forward to is telling the story of of one of Africville's longest protesters. His name is Eddie Carvery. And Eddie has been protesting the destruction of Africville since the 1970s. Uh, he's given a lot of his life to this work. And um, uh, so he had trailers, he's had tents, he's had a numerous things on the land. Um, and most recently in the last year, those trailers were taken away because they were old and, and Eddie just couldn't be on the land anymore. But what I wanted to do was make sure that his presence was there forever. So with the city, we've created something that looks like a trailer. Uh, it's made out of Cortenza steel and it's called Eddie's Place. And on it, it tells the story of, of Eddie's long vigil. So I'm hoping to have that inserted. The, the, the platform for it is already dug and ready. And now we have to get the installation on it, which uh, I hope to do this summer. I'm so glad that Eddie's work um, is being preserved. I know how committed he was, you know. Um, so it's, um, 
tell us some other things that the museum um, has been doing. Well, we've uh, recently also installed an installation dedicated to the Halifax explosion. As you know, a couple of years ago was the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion. But, you know, uh, researchers will tell you about the relief fund uh, that was given to people after the explosion to help rebuild. But there's never been any real, um, and we've, we've talked to a number of different uh, researchers and archivists who uh, say they cannot see where relief came to Africville. And the, the story, the narrative that was given was that Africville was not affected uh, by the Halifax explosion, which of course could not be true. We know that the full impact did not hit Africville uh, because of the way that the land is situated. But certainly houses, foundations uh, were affected and also um, a lot of windows and doors. Um, and so certainly Africville could have used some relief as well. So there is an installation on the land dedicated to that. Uh, one of the other things I want to talk about is um, we love, the land gives so much back to us uh, and often in ways that you don't realize. We, we've gotten better with understanding um, our relationship with the environment uh, and how important it is to take care of the environment and the environment takes care of us. And every day when I go to work, um, often on really nice days, which is quite often, I sit on one of the benches and just look over the water. And there's just a sense of, of calmness and, and purity. Um, and so one of the things we do is we're always looking at ways of bringing other communities into Africville for no other reason to just other than to just enjoy, you know, that that area. And uh, so last year I hosted uh, with partners in the community a free Tai Chi morning uh, every week at 7 a.m. in the morning. And we'd go out and uh, have Tai Chi on the land and then go and start your day and go to work. Uh, and so we're always looking, um, you know, at ways of of um, partnering with other communities, partnering in other ways, and, and doing things that are best for our health because one of the uh, most tragic things that happened to uh, people from Africville and anybody who has been um, undervalued um, uh, in their lifetime is there's a new phrase, uh, and it's new to us, new to me, in the last five to ten years called environmental racism. And environmental racism means that when you get out of bed, it begins. And you think about how do I wear my hair? What clothes am I going to wear? When I walk out this door, how is society going to greet me? What may happen to me today? When a police drives by, you know, do I need to be nervous? Do I need to be concerned? When I go into the grocery store, you know, do I need to be concerned? Is someone going to follow me? Are people going to think that I'm stealing? You know, all these things that nobody else thinks about throughout their day. Black people in Nova Scotia and Native people in Nova Scotia think about these things all the time because we have to, because history has taught us that we need to be vigilant uh, in every aspect of our life. And what does that do to you? It takes away the energy that you would be putting towards other things, other valuable things, your your education, your work, your, you know, your future, you're moving forward. But you it's hard to do when all you're doing is trying to protect yourself. But there are people out there who will, who will say, oh, why well, history? I mean, that's all history. Africa happened in the past. Why do we need to, you know, keep the kind of work you're doing, the kind of work that people like Eddie Carvery um, has been doing for years, and the whole history of this place called Africa, why do we need to keep it alive? Why is it important? It's really important to keep that history alive and to keep talking about it so that, A, of course, we know we never want to repeat the mistakes of the past, but we also need to recognize what we're seeing today because it's not in the past. Uh, within the last 10 years in the province of Nova Scotia, we have had cross burnings still. In the last 10 years, we have had, uh, within the last seven years, we've had a noose placed on a black teacher's door. Um, we have police checking, which is a huge thing 
in 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 Nova Scotia. Um, you know, I, I remember again not because I didn't grow up here. I didn't recognize this until someone pointed it out to me that less than ten years ago I was in a grocery store and um, made a comic phone call to a friend of mine and said, um, "I think this guy is following me." And um, uh, she says to me, go to the baby section. And I went to the baby section. I was standing by the baby powder, and there he was. And she says to me, Juanita, get out of that store. And I did leave. But it was 10 years later that she had to remind me that that's what it was all about. I just thought the guy was being nefarious and was, 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 but it, he was really checking to see if I was stealing anything from the store. But not coming from that background, I never knew what it was all about. That's why we need to keep talking about it because it shows itself even today in so many different ways. And we have to be vigilant and we have to make other people understand uh, that we are not crying wolf. We are not creating uh, uh, situations. We are not overemphasizing. We are not exaggerating. It is real. It happens. It happens um, in the corporate world here in Nova Scotia still, and I'm sure in other parts of Canada uh, and in the in the business world. So we we need to keep telling these stories so that um, people can recognize what it is and understand you know, how that affects people. Yeah, and our children need to know, you know, when they stopped um, for road checks, our boys, need, you know, uh, need to know that um, there are people who see them as, as threats. It's just important, you know, for, in order for them to be able to kind of even understand a lot of what's going on, you know, that, that might seem normal or just... Oh, because it's happened over and over again, it's become institutionalized. You know, we tend to accept, uh, that, at least that's my take of it. You know, if we don't know the history of, you know, what's gone on in the past, we're not able to link them to some of the things we're facing today. And then we lose that resource, you know, that we could actually use to strategize, you know, about how to resolve some of the issues we're facing you know, all around the world today. It's not just in Nova Scotia. I, I, I believe it's not by accident that uh, some of the poorest countries in the world happen to be um, um, countries um, where you have a majority of uh, people of African, uh, Africans as um, the majority of those populations. It's, it's tied into global politics. It, it, I mean, people like Donald Trump don't even hide it. The kind of disdain, yes. you know, in which they hold people of um, uh, people from the continent of Africa or even Africans in um, African Americans, it's it's so pervasive. Yeah. And, I'm and so glad you mentioned that. I'm so glad you mentioned that because since Trump has been in power, it has given a voice to people who would not have dared uh, speak their truth. Uh, in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and so there's this ugliness that uh, has reared its head all around the world uh, mm. since Trump has been in power. And so we have to be diligent and we have to be smarter in how we see that and what we do about it. Um, and so the more we talk, the more we make uh, our colleagues and potential colleagues vigilant as well so that they can recognize what's happening. We can't do this alone. Uh, we need other people to also recognize what is really happening uh, so that we're not, you know, always having to fight the fight on our own. And, and I'm so glad um, that um, we talked about um, the importance of commemorating this and the fact that we cannot do it alone. You know, we need other voices. Um, can you tell us a bit more about other people, you know, who are working in, in this area of keeping our history alive? I hope that uh, some people come and visit Nova Scotia soon because we have so much uh, African Nova Scotian uh, history here. Uh, there is the uh, Black Loyalist Museum in Shelburne, and I tell you, 
it is something. It uh, nope. to stand on that floor is overpowering. And you know, this is where our first peoples landed uh, in this area. And I stand there and I look over that water and just imagine what that must have been like uh, to have crossed that water and landed on those shores. And I also imagine what it was like for our, our people to land in, in the wintertime in that very, very, very cold, cold place. And there's so much to see that'll help you sort of visualize what that might have been like. Uh, we also have the Black Cultural Center of Nova Scotia, which tells the entire history of the the black experience here um and um yes it's uh you know if you're if you decide to do those you know do uh uh take an entire take two days to to do these three museums the africville museum black loyalist uh center and the black cultural center um also you know you can read uh, a number of things by dr ingrid waldron uh lynn jones has an entire collection of, of stories and um, information, historical information uh, at the uh, St. Mary's University. Uh, and um, yeah, so those are uh, two uh, uh, resources that you can start with. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of uh, other wonderful things through Dr. Uh, Isaac Saney uh, and uh, so on and so on. Chike Jeffers, yeah. One of the things I want to uh, mention is that uh, besides the fact that Africville is remembered for how it was treated uh, by the, the government of Nova Scotia, uh, one of the things that's really important to note is some of the wonderful things that came out of Africville. Africville was a community that, you know, was very self-supportive. Uh, and um, one of the things that especially black men could could do and thrive in was boxing. And actually, uh, George Dixon uh, from Africville, who was born in 1870, uh, was the first ever black athlete in the entire world to win a world championship in the entire world. Um, in 1882, he was a world uh, championship boxer. And for those of you who are into uh, sports and boxing, uh, if you've ever heard of shadow boxing, which most people have, that is actually attributed to George Dixon. So uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I have a very ugly container uh, uh, piece, a container ship, we call them sea cans, that's on the property. And I have an artist who's actually creating a 3D uh, painting of, of George Dixon. Uh, that'll be on, it's, it'll be a boxing ring with George Dixon in it. And uh, that'll be on the property as a piece of, uh, of um, uh, art for people to look at. Uh, the other person, um, Portia White, uh, yes. who was a, an international contralto singer. Well, one of the ways that Portia uh, paid for her uh, conservatory music lessons was she had received um, a teaching degree from Dalhousie University and she taught primary in Africville. So she taught primary school in the little community of Africville in Lucasville and that gave her the funds to continue her, her, her music studies. And of course, the most... Uh, Sylvia Hamilton made a documentary about her life, didn't she? That's right. It's called uh, uh, Portia White, Think on Me, uh, mm -hmm. and that is accessible. You can probably get it in any library. Uh, and if you can't, just go online, and I'm sure you'll be able to watch it online. Uh, Af uh, Portia White, Think on Me. Um, and also, uh, a lot of people will have heard of uh, Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington spent a lot of time in, in Africville, and his longtime companion was from Africville. Her heritage was in Africville. And in wow. fact, um, I have a new exhibit called A Walk Through Africville. It's 800 feet, <laughs> square feet. Uh, and in that uh, exhibit is a song that uh, Duke Ellington wrote uh, for uh, this descendant of Africville called Clara. And uh, so a lot of wonderful things came out of, of Africville and, uh, and were part of the Africville history. Thank you so much, Juanita, for enriching our lives, you know, with um, this uh, session, you know, uh, on Africville.
It's certainly a history worth celebrating. You know, wherever there are Africans alive, we, we need to celebrate the spirit of Africa. Yes, my absolute pleasure. And and uh, I love telling the story of Africville because it is a story of resilience. Uh, you know, every time I, I, I always say I, I, I treat it like the uh, Grinch who stole Christmas. You know, the Grinch thought you could take all these things away and people would stop celebrating Christmas. You take the presents away, you take the music away, you take the food away. And they did the same to Africville. They took the church away, they took the houses away, but people still celebrate and still come together and share stories to remind everybody what was really important about Africville. I hope this episode and the last one on Africville have highlighted for us some of the interconnectedness that are often lost in mainstream history. Thank you for being a part of it. Please don't forget to subscribe if you have not already done so. Please feel free to share and uh, like the videos. See you next time. Oh, no, no.